much for coming. Um, as with many of the other speakers uh, in this session, we're going to um, be looking at how we can use ethnographic analogy to think through relational, relational ontologies amongst um, past hunter-gatherers. Um, we're going to be looking particularly at um, the North European Mesolithic, and we're going to be drawing <coughs> specifically on ethnographic studies of animist groups uh, from the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and we argue that um, we can see evidence for an animist ontology in the archaeological record through analogy with the ethnography. But um, we would suggest that um, we need to be careful how we use this ethnographic record. And I think one of the things we really need to consider is whether a Mesolithic animism is directly analogous to what we see amongst contemporary and historically attested <coughs> hunter-gatherer groups in sort of the, north, the northern hemisphere, or whether we're looking at something that's slightly different and it's distinctly Mesolithic that we need to be studying uh, in its own right. And then one of the first issues that we need to consider is that animism as a term describes a very broad and varied set of practices and beliefs, and these aren't necessarily common to all animist groups. So we do need to be cautious about which aspects of this record we're going to draw on. Uh, but we'd argue that there are two themes that are broadly consistent amongst animist uh, societies. Uh, the first of these, rather obviously, is the idea of animacy and the idea that things other than humans can be sentient and self-aware. But even within this common theme, there are some variability. There is some variability. So among some groups, uh, aspects of the world, particularly plants, animals, topographic features and so forth, uh, can be considered to be anim animate or sentient. Um, however, in other societies, amongst, ad amongst other anim animist groups, um, these aspects of the world aren't necessarily animate, but are under the control and protection of what we might describe as supernatural beings, and it's those that are the, the sentient, self-aware, animate uh, aspects of the world. Uh, and then in some cases, it's a combination of the two, where certain plants and animal species may be animate and sentient, whilst also being under the control and protection of uh, other supernatural beings who are also animate. But despite this variability, I think the key point is that um, aspects of the world other than humans are animate, and that these sentient beings, what, whatever form they might take, are considered to, be, considered to be knowledgeable social actors, fully aware of the world around them, and capable of complex social interactions with humans. Uh, the second theme really arises as an implication of the animate nature of the world in which these people inhabit. And that's that economic activities, or success in economic activities, rely as much on the goodwill of animals, plants, or guardian spirits, as it does on human skill and ability. And so for this reason, economic practices are often structured around prescribed rules of behaviour uh, that ensure that the animate elements of the world, the non-human animate elements of the world, are not offended by human action. Now these can take a, a wide variety of forms, but I think as archaeologists, probably the most important is that we see very prescribed uh, and very structured forms of deposition, often focusing on the deposition of animal remains and also, in some cases, plant remains. So, for example, Peter Jordan's uh, ethnoarchaeological study of the Canty, he talks about how uh, reindeer, the remains of reindeer and elk, which have been killed and butchered, are then uh, carefully deposited in middens, which are kept in uh, what are described as clean areas, away from settlements and within forests. Um, certain communities of the Cree, um, they have quite different practices. Uh, they will hang the uh, skulls and uh, antlers of certain animals from trees at hunting sites, but they'll also put uh, the postcranial elements of the animals onto raised platforms. And the reason for that is that then uh, scavenging animals can't interfere with the bones, and it's a way of treating the bones with respect. Um, Another a consistent theme, again, amongst many groups is the deposition of uh, the remains of fish and amphibious animals, uh, mammals, into bodies of water, which allows those animals to reincarnate as they go back to uh, their, their own habitats. And in um, Richard Nelson's uh, ethnography of the Koyakon, he described how uh, certain uh, plant materials, particularly plant materials which are ge generated as waste through the manufacture of objects associated with hunting, also have to be deposited in very prescribed, controlled manners. Again, with an emphasis on deposition in clean areas, away from trampling of humans and away from human settlements. 
Now, we argue that analogous forms of deposition and disposal can be seen in assemblages of Mesolithic material, uh, both in Britain and Northwest Europe. And we're going to demonstrate this first with a case study from the north of England, and then with a brief review of evidence from sites across northern Europe. And we're going to start by looking at um, the evidence from the eastern Vale of Pickering in North Yorkshire, in the northeast of England, and particularly uh, the landscape of the Paleo Lake Flixton. Uh, here we have 25 areas of Mesolithic activity, uh, all focused around the shores of a now extinct Paleo Lake, known as uh, Lake Flixton. Um, many of these sites have been identified through test pitting and field walking exclusively, so we only have uh, <coughs> lithic scatters from these sites. But in some cases, we also have um, reasonably large assemblages, in some cases very large assemblages, of well-preserved organic materials, particularly animal bone, but other materials as well, which have been preserved in the sediments that formed at the edge of the lake. Um, we also, in a number of cases, also have ex uh, excavations on what would have been dryland parts of these sites away from the lake shore, where excavations have recorded sequences of pits within which there seems to be very deliberate forms of deposition and disposal. Now, in terms of using um, this archaeology to think about depositional practices, perhaps our best evidence comes in the early Mesolithic site of Star Car, which is located here, oh, oh yeah, there, at the west, on this peninsula on the western end of the lake. And there, your excavations in the 1940s, and then more recently over the past few years, has recorded a very large assemblage of animal bone, uh, objects made from um, animal remains, uh, but also um, plant materials, particularly wood and woodworking debris from the lake edge uh, sediments. And these seem to be associated in some cases with a, with a series of large uh, timber platforms or trackways. And it's within this material that we can see evidence for a number of different forms of depositional practice. So first we have the very deliberate treatment of objects made from animal remains. This is particularly uh, barbed projectile points, such as one uh, Amy's hand there, uh, which are made, uh, projectile points made from the antler of red deer. But we also have um, axes and mattocks made from elk and red deer antler as well. Um, these have all been deposited into uh, shallow standing water or into boggy, seasonally flooded uh, parts of the, of the wetlands, um, despite their state of repair. So some are clearly <coughs> broken beyond use, some have slight damage and can be easily repaired. And they've all been, to some extent, decommissioned prior to deposition. So they've all, they all lack their wooden hearts or handles, which isn't a taphonomic issue because you have plenty of well-preserved wood. Um, so they've all been de-hafted prior to deposition. And the, the wooden hearts or handles have either been retained or they've been deposited elsewhere. And in the case of the projectile points, we also see evidence for uh, deliberate curation of these objects as well. So the assemblage includes uh, broken tips and midsections of bar points which have either just been deliberately snapped and then deposited into the lake or these are broken in use in which case they're being retrieved from hunting sites, recovered from the carcasses of animals, kept together and then deposited at the same time in the same place as these other artefacts. Uh, we also see evidence for the retention and then deposition of animal heads, or skulls. Um, the majority of these are red deer skulls, many of which have been fashioned into uh, red deer antler frontlets or headdresses, such as uh, this one here. Um, and these, have, again, have been deposited into the lake in the same place as we're finding the objects made from bone and antler. Um, although most of these, a lot of these have been modified, we also find unmodified red deer skulls being deposited into the same parts of the, of the lake at roughly the same time. Um, as numerous studies have shown, the red deer skulls or frontlets, whether modified or unmodified, um, are hugely overrepresented in relation to the postcranial parts of the body, which suggests that people are deliberately retaining and curating skulls and then depositing them. In other words, there are more heads than there are red deer bodies. Um, it's not just red deer skulls, though. We also find uh, elk, roe deer, and to some extent auroch skulls also being deposited into the wetlands. Now, these aren't overrepresented, so there isn't the same evidence for deliberate curation of these objects, of these parts of the body. But in at least some cases, we can see that people are depositing these separately from the postcranial elements. In at least one case, there's an elk skull which has been placed in sh shallow standing water next to an elk, uh, a red deer skull. So it's a deliberate choice to retain and, de and deposit these skulls away from the rest of the body. <coughs> 
And then finally, on at least two occasions, whole animal carcasses are being brought into the lake, brought into the lake and then deposited, deposited there. Um, in one case, this involves the bodies of at least one or possibly more adult red deer, which has been carried, dragged into the lake, uh, probably along a platform, a trackway made from uh, woodworking debris, and then deposited into a relatively deep part uh, of, the, of the lake edge of the, of, of the, of the lake at the edge of the site, um, along with a whole range of other osseous artefacts. Um, a separate discrete act occurs sometime later is the deposition of a whole dog skeleton, which is uh, what we've got here. So a whole dog skeleton brought in, deposited, deposited into the lake, and then as the body has decayed, the um, body the body has basically broken apart in shallow water. But we believe this was originally uh, a complete animal body brought into the lake. <coughs> now these different depositionary, pra de depositionary practices have different temporal scales. So the, the deposition of the whole red deer carcass or carcasses um, was one of the very first acts undertaken at the site. It is, it's statistically indistinguishable from several other sort of the earliest radiocarbon dates we have on the site. So one of the first things people do at Skarkar is kill one or more red deer and drag the entire carcass in an unbutchered state and dump it in the lake. At around the same time as they do that, they begin depositing skulls, frontlets, and objects made from bone and antler. But that, those practices then continue throughout much of the 500 years that the site is occupied for. And then the deposition of the dog carcass is a discrete act which occurs later in the site's history. So, and I think this difference in the, sort of the temporality of these uh, acts, some being very discreet, some uh, being part of a long-term tradition, uh, suggests differences in the motivations that lie behind them. Now these practices aren't limited to star car. So a small assemblage of barbed uh, projectile points has been re report, recorded from, uh, during excavations at a site uh, on a former island within the lake, about 750 metres away from Star Car. So we have a small assemblage of barbed projectile points. Again, we have complete or near complete and broken examples. Again, these are all de-hafted. So these have been treated in the same way, deposited in the same way as the material from Star Car and are occurring at roughly the same time. So this, this is contemporary for uh, practices of deposition. Um, at Flixton Schoolhouse Farm on the southern shore of the lake, we have a small assemblage of auroch bone which has been deposited into a small, uh, shallow, or sorry, small deep pool of water, slightly set away from the lake shore. Um, the excavation, when this was excavated, it occurs in a, in a very, very discreet uh, sort of pile, and it looks as if this has been either wrapped up in something or put in a bag and then deposited into the pool. Um, this. The bones themselves aren't dated, but based on pollen stratigraphy, this is again is broadly is occurring at the same time as the acts of deposition at Starkar and Menaim Hill. And we also have some evidence that it's not just animal remains that have been treated in a formal manner. So again, at Flixton School has farm with a sequence of pits. In one of these pits is, is a broken grinding stone, probably used for grinding hazelnuts. There's a lot of evidence for hazelnut processing at the site. This stone has been broken with a single blow to one side, which has shattered part of the stone. All the elements of the stone have been brought together, placed in a pit, and then the pit has been filled with the detritus from hazelnut roasting. Um, and this occurred, this is slightly later than activity on the other sites we just mentioned. So we can see a range of depositionary acts, often involving the remains of animals, but sometimes plants, occurring in multiple locations, but throughout parts of the early Mesolithic and at roughly the same time within the same landscape. And I think we can see similar practices across much of uh, Mesolithic Northwest Europe. So if we think of the, the late Mesolithic uh, shell middens on the west coast of Scotland, these contain assemblages of osseous material culture. And again, as with Starkar, these occur in very similar forms. So we get intact barb points, we get broken barb points, we get the debris from manufacturing these objects and so forth. Um, other British sites also have evidence for careful collection and deposition of animal remains. So a site that uh, uh, Nick analysed, uh, Faraday Road in the Kennet Valley in Berkshire, of a large assemblage of animal bone, predominantly wild boar, which is deposited together in a discrete area of the site, in a small hollow. Um, what Nick showed is that this material is generated by multiple hunting events, 
which aren't occurring at the same time. They're, they're occurring at the very least, they're occurring at different times of the year. But all of this material at each, after each hunt is being deposited together in the same part of the site. So you've got ongoing or repeat and repeating patterns of deposition focused over the same material in the same location. And we can also see evidence of this if we look at Mesolithic, early Mesolithic Scandinavia. So uh, probably one of the best known sites is Lundby Mose in Denmark. We have five separate deposits of elk bone, uh, which have been deposited into a small kettle hole, which would have been a pond, a small pond or pool of water during the early Mesolithic. Um, each of these assemblages contains heavily processed faunal material deriving from the butchery and processing of one or more individual animals. Four of these deposits occur in very discrete clusters, and again, as we flip them through our farm, it's been suggested that these are being either wrapped up in something or put into bags and then deposited into shallow water. And the ostia, the, the zooarchaeologist who looked at this material attempted to ref look at refits of bone between these uh, deposits, none of the bone refits, and so it's suggested that these are separate, uh, temporally separate acts of deposition. Um, Equally, a survey of early Mesolithic material uh, from southern Scandinavia by Prook Peterson and Brinch Peterson um, identified several more sites where animal remains are being treated in a similarly prescribed manner. So this includes at least two more sites where we've got very discrete deposits of elk bones, again deriving from the butchery of multiple individuals, which have been deposited into bodies of water. These are our uh, early 20th century excavations, so it's not quite clear um, if these all are quite spatially uh, restricted as the Lundby sites, but they, they certainly appear to be so. Um, we also have um, the curation and caching of objects made uh, from the remains of animals, and also the deposition of whole animals. And it has been argued that some of these animals, that the, uh, the um, discovery of whole animal carcasses in the early Mesolithic sites in Scandinavia are animals which have escaped. Uh, they've been shot, uh, wounded, but have escaped their hunters and have died sad, lonely deaths in the uh, in, in a lake somewhere. Uh, but the auroch, uh, one of the examples, of, uh, the auroch from V, um, was stabbed with a spear which penetrated both its shoulder blades. I can't imagine that animal running very far or being able to elude anything other than the Mr. Magoo of Mesolithic hunters. <laughs> Now, I, I realise I'm, I'm massively over time already, and also this is hardly an exhaustive survey of uh, the fallen assemblages of Mesolithic Europe. It's reasonable to say that there are probably lots of sites where we don't see prescribed forms of deposition. However, I'd argue, or we would all argue, that most of these assemblages have been studied from a very, very focused sort of economic perspective. Uh, and if you just ask economic questions, you just get economic answers. So unless you actually come to these assemblages and start asking different questions, such as issues of uh, deposition and disposal, you're unlikely to see it. So with this caveat in mind, is this evidence for animist ontologies in the European Mesolithic? And we would say yes for two reasons. Uh, the first is the forms of deposition are very reminiscent of what we see in the uh, ethnographic record. And not just because it's a deposition of animals or parts of animals, but because we're also we're look really looking at conscious choices that people are make making to treat the remains of animals and in some cases plants in particular ways, not just once, but repeatedly over short and long-term scales. And this suggests long-standing traditions relating to appropriate treatment of certain animal species. And second, um, in most of these cases, these practices are clearly related to economic activities. Someone goes off, kills an animal, butchers it, processes it, break the carcass, breaks the carcass down, and then deposits some of this material, and then they go and do it again. And it's that link we believe, with the economic activities, which creates, I think, the strongest uh, ethnographic sort of analogy or parallel. However, just to, just to finish off, um, this material does differ from the ethnographic accounts in a number of ways, and I'm running out of time, so I won't really go into it, but basically, ethnographic studies of northern circumpolar groups often don't include uh, the deposition of terrestrial mammals in standing water. It's usually associated with fish and amphibious mammals, and also whole animal deposition is something which, which is very rare, particularly the association that has with animal sacrifice, which again isn't something that's often carried out as much by hunter-gatherers. Um, 
And so I think we'd argue that what we're seeing is very specific mesolithic animism, or in fact, we're looking across Europe, we're actually looking at probably different animist traditions across, U across mesolithic Europe, and that really what we need to do is to start thinking about mesolithic animism as an ontology in its own right. Sorry for running over. Thank you very much. Thank you.